Welcome to Decoded. I'm Simon Shackleton and in this series I'll be analysing a well-known piece of music and trying to figure out what makes it so successful. And the first track we're going to look at in this series is Bicep and their awesome piece of breakbeat electronica glue. So, you know, you'll all be familiar with this track. It's been doing the rounds over the last few years and it's absolutely catapulted Bicep into kind of mainstream major electronic artist territory. The way that I'm going to dive into this track, because obviously I don't have the individual production parts available to look at, so I'm going to look at four or five different aspects of the track. First of all, we're going to talk about the vibe. Then we're going to go on and look at what kind of instrument, instrumentations being used. We're going to talk about the listener journey. Then we'll look briefly at the mix down, the kind of places that you'll be hearing this track. And then finally, I'll just kind of wrap things up with a bow and just talk very briefly about what makes this track so successful. So first of all, let's have a little listen to the track just from the start and then I'll needle drop a couple of times through it so you can just get a feel for the way the tune progresses and if you want to listen to the track in its entirety then there's a Spotify link down below in the description and you can listen to the whole track and then come back to the video. I really like the way this track starts with such kind of intention and also the way that the elements just fold in. about the vibe of the track for a second. I mean for me it has a really wistful sense of kind of melancholy longing to it but what I think is really interesting about the emotions that it evokes is that although it's in a minor key and it does have that kind of reflective feel to it it also somehow feels very optimistic which I think is partly down to the way that they structure these chords. They're very very simple and they're not hugely complex chords at all. Like each chord is simply a minor triad, which is just a collection of three very simple notes. And they rotate around this kind of four bar phrase, which is established right from the off by the way that the drums work. And you can actually see from the waveform here on the screen how every four bars throughout the entire duration of the track, they do this kind of like half bar stop where the beats stop and then come back in again and obviously as the as the track goes on there's more sort of infill information in these gaps but at no point do the drums actually play kind of consistently for like an eight bar phrase and that almost becomes something that is a trademark element within the track um so the mood itself i mean it, it it's it's really warm, it's really inviting to listen to. And we're going to investigate why that is. So in terms of the era that the track was written in, a question to ask about this is, is when it was written, because it certainly doesn't necessarily feel like it was written in you know, 2016, 2017. It could well have been written 20 years ago. And I think part of the reason for that is the sound palette that they use is very much, um, they're very much kind of classic electronica sounds, sounds that we're familiar with, sounds that we've 
grown up listening to, especially if you're as old as me, you know, going way back to the 90s, some of these sounds are, they're very familiar. The sounds themselves are, they're warm and inviting and a little bit kind of analogue sounding um, and just not overly processed and the programming itself is really simplistic. It's very, very simple. It's very subtle. But at the same time, it's it's surprisingly detailed and engaging once you kind of dive into it. So we have this kind of classic sound palette. We have this melancholic yet optimistic emotional tone to the track. The tempo itself is actually surprisingly fast. It, this track runs at 130 beats per minute, which kind of surprised me, and I'm usually quite a good judge of guessing the tempo of something. Part of the reason why it feels like it's slower than it is is because there's something quite laconic about the programming. You know, there's no busyness with the drums so if we just look at this very initial like opening salvo from the drums let's just think about what's actually involved in that drum kit that they've put together there's a sub bass there's a snare a kick a kind of shaker and then some weird little scrapey sound that's going on in the background Let's just give it another listen. Now, part of the reason why that works so well as a very simple loop is, A, it sounds kind of classic. It almost sounds like it's sampled off an old school record. Now, I've put together a, a little kind of plug-in chain here at the bottom. And what this is going to do is it's just going to enable me to... Um, pick out one or two of the frequencies um, that we're listening to and it's also going to allow me to look at the stereo field which is you know it's, it's really interesting to see how artists work with the stereo field and why that's so effective now what I've done here in this FabFilter Pro MB plugin is I've just created six different um, EQ bands and these EQ bands I can isolate and we can just listen to them purely on their own. Now if we roll this drum loop round you'll just hear how clearly defined each drum part is. So there isn't a huge amount of overspill of specific drum parts into different EQ bands and as a result it means that this drum loop is really nicely separated. Um, so let's just give it a quick listen again. You can see here that we have, this is a, um, a spectrum analyzer, so this analyzes the frequencies that we're listening to. And if you're not familiar with this software, the deepest bass frequencies are on the far left hand side and the highest inaudible um, treble frequencies are on the right hand side. So we can see that this is actually a really well balanced loop. You also notice, see these peaks around here, and this is, I don't know, probably looking at about 11 or 12 kilohertz here. You can see that just beyond that, things roll off pretty sharply, like the, t the very top end has been rolled off. So it's not overly bright, it's not overly shiny, and that, and that gives this sense of kind of vintage feel and analog warmth and that's something that they do throughout the track. So if we now go through these frequency bands just listening to the drums the, to the drums you'll see how effectively they manage the different frequency ranges of this particular kit. Just the subsonic bass there. And then if we bring in this now you can pretty much just hear in this lower mid band, or in this bass band really, that's just the punch of the kick. There's almost nothing else happening in that particular band. Now this is where you start getting in a bit of the, the reverbs. You can hear some reverb. 
And you can also hear the bottom end of the snare drum here. And here we can just hear the, the lower end of that shuffly percussion, but by and large, this is where the real punch of the kick drum and the, um, well, not the kick drum, but this is where the, uh, the presence of the kick drum and the snare are, are being felt. And then as we go and add this particular band, so we're now going up to about 2K. Very kind of mid-rangey sound. And then if we just listen to the very top end of this loop, that's what's giving it its shine. And all of that just fits together really seamlessly to create a really nicely balanced loop. Now, if we look on the right hand side here, I have a plugin called Voxengo Span, which you can download for free. I'm using it in mid side mode. And let me just explain what we're looking at here. So you see these darker green colors. The darker green colors correspond to the mono part of the, the uh, signal i.e. elements within this sound where the left and right hand sides are identical to one another. And then the lighter colours here are the stereo content or the side content. Any, anytime you see any orange, that means that the side content is effectively exceeding the volume of the mono content. And generally speaking, that's something I like to try and avoid at all costs in my own mixes. But you can see that even within this loop, there's actually a lot of stereo content. So it's quite nicely spread apart, but there's also some strong mono push straight down the middle of the mix. And it's really, because the drums are relatively simple in this track, they have presence, they have some width, but by and large, what you're hearing is something that's very much kind of punching straight down the middle of the mix. Now let's just go through the gears here a little bit and just look at how they introduce new elements. So when we get to bar 17, they're going to bring in the first kind of real musical element of the, of the piece. And you can hear that kind of chopped up, gated vocal sound is very rhythmic actually. It's very propulsive, it's quite hooky although you probably struggle to accurately sing along to it, but it has quite a rhythmic feel to it. So I love the way that they've brought that in alongside the rhythms at the beginning, and it's almost kind of integrates really nicely into what the kit's doing. It also confers that sort of wistful sense of melancholy that we were talking about. Um, just the way that they tail off those, like the tails of the, of the sound, it's a really nice effect with some reverb added as well. You can see here, just by highlighting these bands, that mono content, if you're listening in headphones, and I'd recommend it actually to really pick out some of this sort of dynamic movement that's happening in the stereo field. You can hear how that um, that gated sound, it's almost like there's a reverbed portion of it which is being panned kind of independently of the dry signal, of the, of the non-reverb part of that vocal signal. And that, that's really interesting because it creates this real sort of slightly discombobulating stereo vibe. Um, and, and because the drums feel very sort of centred within the mix, this sound that's just come in has space to operate and it's kind of revolving neatly around my my brain, which I kind of like. So as we go through the gears here, we have this particular idea. Let's get rid of these guys. Now at bar 25, you can hear there's a very warm sounding synth part that's come in. And what I find really interesting about this is how this warm synth part that's come in occupies a very different frequency band to the vocal sample. Now, if the vocal sample wasn't gated and chopped up and if it didn't have that propulsive sense of momentum to it, then this pad sound and that vocal sound would all turn into this kind of very 
floaty sort of mushy vibe and um i think what they've done really successfully here is they've just very much differentiated between the role and function of each of these parts so the pads role when it comes in is to suddenly broaden out the sound and if we just listen to let's just listen to a few bars before that and then just hear what happens when that that warm pad sound, that warm synth sound comes in underneath the rhythms. And you can hear how that particular pad sound is very much occupying this kind of bassy, low mid side of the EQ range. It also has some real kind of nice width to it, but it also has none of that propulsive momentum and sort of dynamic movement that the chopped up vocal has. So not only is it performing a completely different function, but it's also occupying a completely different area of the frequency spectrum. It's also a really nice wide sound, so it's giving us some extra kind of stereo width. But you'll notice that at the bottom end here of the track, so below about 100 hertz, really below about 150 um, hertz here, there's very, very little stereo information. And from a music production point of view, that is always the way to go. Having huge amounts of stereo uh, bass parts going on is, is a surefire way of creating clutter and minimising the clarity of your mix down. So the way this is mixed down is just really effective. If we listen to the track as a whole. Can just see how completely balanced that kind of frequency spectrum is and while we're talking about that as well i'm just going to open up this spl hawkeye plugin now this this one's a little bit intimidating to look at um, but it, it, it's just really a measurement tool so it, it shows you all kinds of interesting information it shows you the relative loudness of the track for example and there's a, there's a lot of debate about how loud you should be mixing and mastering tracks. Well, if you look at this track, like the integrated loudness here is around about minus 12 LUFS, and that is nowhere near as loud as some of the heavier kind of end of, um, say, EDM. Um, and like rock and metal and you know I, I've read things on forums with people kind of bragging really about how they managed to get their you know their LUFS or their integrated loudness down to like minus 4 dB what that means if you're not really clear about this terminology is the, the lower that number so if you're down at minus 4 um, LUFS, it means that that sort of differential between the loudest parts and the quietest parts of your track is tiny. And what that means is there's no real breathing space. There's no real dynamic range. So what you're doing is you're really, if you're pushing music that hard, you're sacrificing musicality and the quality of the, of, of the mix itself. You're sacrificing it purely in the pursuit of ridiculous loudness. Um, anyway, so, you know, they, they're not mixing this track hugely loudly at all. It's just really nicely balanced and a good way of checking on that as well. When you zoom into these waveforms, you'll notice there's a little bit of headroom at the top. And that's very common these days in mastering to ensure that when you take a track and, send, and, and actually encode it as uh, an MP3, what will often happen if you've exported your track or you've mastered it to exactly zero um, db you'll often find that these weird kind of clipping artifacts can enter when you um, when you basically convert to a lossy format like mp3 is because you're effectively compromising by you know changing your kind of data sets and all the rest of it so 
it's always worth bearing in mind when you are mastering just to ensure that you preserve a, like a little bit of headroom at the very top of the mix. Looking at the waveform, you can see that you know this has probably hit a limiter at some point, but we can see by the fact that the waveform itself hasn't really changed shape, so there's no real clipping going on at the top. You can see when that is happening by the very top of these waveforms almost turning into square waves, so they almost become completely flat lines and you'll notice that on a super loud um, super aggressive master what that tends to do to the listener is it becomes very exhausting very quickly um, so again that's something I like to really avoid in my own mixing and my own mastering Okay, so we've looked a little bit about the way that they introduce these sounds. Now this, this warm pad comes in, and I think there's a really interesting section here between about 45 seconds and a minute 30. So we have six different four bar sections here where no really new musical ideas come in at all. And this is how we get from here to here. So this is the point where the bass comes in. And you can also hear that warm pad sound, that s string sound or synth sound that we have in the, um, you know, underpinning the the, um, the the higher pitch gated sound. You can hear that when that comes in here, there's actually a sort of breathy overtone to it, almost like a sort of synthesized voice. So how do we get there? Because when it first comes in, it sounds like this very very subtle and then what happens over time is they're very very gradually just ramping that up slightly probably boosting a little bit of uh, the frequency envelope so it just feels like it's unfurling and opening And in a sense, what this whole section's doing is it's just, it's allowing you to become familiar with the track, but it's almost just reeling you in. It's, it's, it's got you. By bar 25, you're kind of hooked, and you want to see what's going to happen next. It just very slowly flows like water to the point where this bass comes in at bar 49. Listen to the very top end of that, the highest frequencies, there's like a which is as close as they get to like a big, big moment in a sense. And what they're doing with that sound is they're, they're, they're just sort of allowing that idea just to sort of unfurl. Um, we can probably pick that out using the Pro MB again. So if we just pick out the very top band because it's a bit hard to hear otherwise. We're just listening out for that fizziness at the very top end here. You hear how that's in there, but it's, it's almost indiscernible. They've mixed that really, really low. But it's there. So they brought in this new idea um, of the bass line, and the bass line is just really replicating what we've already been hearing. We still have this identical kind of four bar shift. Now we're at bang in the middle of the track here, because this track's only like four and a half minutes long or something, but bang in the middle of the track, you might typically expect somebody to do a breakdown where the drums go away, where there's a build up of some sort, could be very subtle, you would expect it to be subtle in the case of bicep, but you'd expect something to happen that maybe introduces another element or whatever. And they do introduce another element at bar 73, and this is kind of where everything is effectively playing. But what they do instead of having a breakdown, they simply go back to the beats from the beginning. <laughs> 
just with that little additional bit of reverb on a sounds like an 8 of 8 um, snare. And then that's where that kind of sustained vocal comes in along, along the top there. So what, what that has the effect of doing is it makes this track feel slightly unconventional. It's not demanding much of the listener at all. It's like once it starts, you know that you've got a very undemanding and very pleasant listen for the next kind of four and a half minutes. There's no big drop where you, you, know, you wander over to the machine or whatever and you, you decide to turn it up. It just is very, very linear and it's very smooth. And the fact that they don't go with a breakdown just creates this sort of sense of flow, I think. And it just kind of one section just simply eases into the next section really seamlessly. Now here we have effectively three different musical ideas. If you forget about the bass, we have three different musical ideas. We have our, our synth pad sound. We have the... <laughs> the chopped up um, gated vocal and then also we have an additional vocal the the kind of like sung vocal over the top and you can tell by the way that they process that as well it's just really clever the way that each of those sounds has its own kind of ring fence piece of space to operate within. And that's partly down to the way that they use the stereo field to place sounds. And it's also partly down to the way they use the frequency spectrum to highlight certain aspects of the, um, of the track. So, <clears throat> you know, this, this track, it, it, I mean, we're getting to the point now where there isn't really anything else musically there's this section where some of those more sustained sounds are actually chopped up as well and that brings a little bit of relief so that they can then reopen things and have things unfurling once again later in the track so you have you know more of a, a rhythmic section going back into a smoother section so there is some contrast very important Now, if you listen to the bottom end of this part, let's just highlight that. Now look at the difference between bar 73, where it's all very sustained, down in this bass part of the, let's add the subs, all very lush and very sustained. And then here, still got the, the sub bass kick there, but if we take that out, you can hear that literally every part pretty much is being now gated. And what that does is it just really differentiates this kind of back end of the track to the front end of the track. It's also a really good example, I think, of how to really maximize a small gene pool of kind of musical DNA throughout the course of a track. So rather than them going out and trying to find a new sound to kind of sustain the interest, this is a really great exercise in just making the absolute best out of what you have. And often you'll find that if you're able to do that and just minimize the number of parts you have in the track and thereby minimizing the complexity, you can create something that is just um, a much easier and less demanding kind of piece of music to listen to. So in terms of like I said at the beginning, we just touch on the listener journey. Well, we've been doing that as we've gone through this track and there are some quite distinct sections. So we have this sort of slow unfurling of the ideas up to the point where the bass happens. There's only two main musical ideas all the way up to one minute 30. And then we have the sustained bass chord in. And then we have our little rhythmic drop. Our new top end vocal sample comes in around here, which is two minutes 15. And then the back end of the track, everything becomes more chopped up and more gated, but effectively the parts remain in place. So structurally speaking, it's a very, very simple track to listen to.
and as a result i think it's you know it's extremely uh engaging and um and easy to listen to so let's just finish off here by talking about where you might hear this track and why i think it's so effective so you know on a huge sound system this is going to sound great it's really well balanced it covers the entire frequency spectrum and there's plenty of sort of subsonic energy there to really get you moving if you're listening to it in a club or a live show but at the same time the sounds themselves are undemanding they're kind of nostalgic and they feel like we feel like we know them we feel like they're long lost friends because we've been hearing these sounds for the last 20 30 years within the the realm of electronic music and then at the same time part of the reason why this is music that I'll often listen to when I'm you know cooking dinner or just hanging out and having friends over or whatever and part of the reason why I like to do that is because it is relatively undemanding it's not going to it's not going to stress anybody out there's very very few people that will go running to the stereo and and turn it off and you know put on some skrillex or something it's not going to happen but you know it's it's um i think it's a really interesting uh it's an interesting piece because it seems to cover lots of different bases and therefore it has so much potential to be heard by people in multiple environments and it seems to work kind of equally across those one of the technical reasons i think why it works so well as a sort of nostalgic and slightly vintage feeling track and i'm just going to play some of this here from the um from the main point where everything's playing and what you're going to do is just look at this graphic eq down here and this is this tells us a lot about this track You can see here across the stereo, uh, across the um, the frequency spectrum, just how nicely balanced everything is. There are no real holes or scoops within that mix. The bass, as you would expect, is very slightly louder than um, you know than other elements within the track. But also, if you're a music producer, it's really worth noting how much the bass actually falls off below about 50 hertz. Now, this feels perfectly deep and warm and lush enough but what they're not doing here is around like you know between sort of 30 and 50 hertz they're not adding a load of information down there or they're at least cutting some of that information out and that just allows them a lot more kind of headroom to breathe because most of the frequencies down here are largely inaudible and they take up an awful lot of sort of headroom at the mix stage the other thing that's especially interesting i think is over around about what are we talking here we're maybe looking at I don't know 10k so 10 kilohertz right here things drop substantially and as I said earlier on when we were just looking at the beats that's very much a characteristic of that sort of nostalgic sound that like slightly older school production where generally speaking things weren't quite as fizzy and excitable as some of the productions that you hear nowadays um, and and i think as a result of of just mitigating some of that top end in their final mix down and also in the sound choices where they've actually you know chosen to put the sounds in the track i think what they've done is they've just created a really nice warm sort of vintage feel so let's just all wrap it up now and just recap on why this track is so successful. I think it evokes um, some really interesting sort of emotions. It's able to be melancholy whilst being uplifting at the same time. It's quite reflective and it's quite thoughtful. Um, so in a way you could say that emotionally it has a sort of neutrality to it it doesn't necessarily imply one thing or the other so it leaves a lot open for you as the listener to interpret in whatever way you see fit which i think is great it has a relatively sparse sound palette which can you know mean that the track is easy to listen to has a sort of production style 
where it feels quite nostalgic and quite vintage, which then ties in with the sound choices that they've made. And it works in a whole range of different situations from a massive sound system to a tiny kind of iPhone that you're listening to while you're cooking your dinner. So that's about it for this particular episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've been wanting to do this for ages, so I'm really excited to be able to dive into this and hopefully some, some other tracks over the coming weeks and months. If you've got any suggestions, I'd love to hear them down below in the comments. And if you've enjoyed the video, I'd love you to like and subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything new when it comes up. Also, you might want to check out my website at mixingmasteringmentoring.com where I offer one-to-one -one mentoring sessions and also mixing and mastering services. So I'll see you on the next episode of Decoded.